chapter 8. It's talking about Philip and the Ethiopian. I don't know if you know that story or not, but it says these words. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place, and he rose and he went, and there was the Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, to go over and join his, this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he, he invited Philip to come up to sit with him. Now the message of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to slaughter, like a lamb before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth. And beginning with this scripture, he told them that he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized them. And when he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. I found it interesting, as I read that scripture earlier in this week, that the road was mentioned twice. They were on the road, and he got back on. This morning, we're going to have a baptism. So we're going to do a little bit different this morning. Because I want to encourage each and every one of you to get up out of your seat. And I want you to come forward to the baptism. Just everyone come up out of your seat and just come forward. If you can stand next to it, stand next to it. Just come forward. I want each of you to witness baptism. At first hand. I know that many of you have been already baptized. You may have seen it, you may have gone to that water and come up yourself. But I want you to witness it from other people in that Come, come forward. Short people in the front, tall people in the back. All tall people in the back. If you can't make it all the way to the front, maybe you can just stand there where you're at and you'll see. But I want to encourage you to come forward and see this baptism in a unique and special way. This is Raya, and she's come to be baptized here. Pray in front of all these people. You put your faith in trust. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
this says midnight, but it's not midnight. About probably about 3 30 in the morning, I'm gonna be here. And I need two people that will come and help me because we're gonna get close to a 200 pound tape. I can't let that over hot coals by myself. So if two people will commit to come and be here to help make sure to take care of that. Oh, 
You've given us the ministry, Lord, of reconciling the world to you. And Lord, may we be honorable to that command to be witnesses. Father, I pray for each and every word being spoken today that it is your word and not my word. I pray for the Holy Spirit to be upon this place, Lord, like never before, to change our hearts, to change our lives as we hear the word and we obey it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day for those of you who are fathers. Praise God for that. Uh, we always need godly fathers in the world today. Amen. What you say? And, and for those of you who have lost your father, for those of you who uh, perhaps don't know your father, uh, if you grew up like I grew up, I did not know my father. My father left when I was about four years old, and I had not seen him or heard from him until my younger sister and my father tried to change my life. I did not know him before he died. Um, I had no clue about what he was truly like. But the one father that I know that loves me more than anything else in the world is the true father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you today that even though your father passed away, maybe you didn't know your father, that, that God himself will always be there in love for you. He has the love that is never ending. It will never fail. It's not like human love but it's godly love. And so, happy Father's Day for all of us. Well, during the last few weeks, we've been talking about how to become a witness to our families, to our neighbors, and to everyone else we come in contact with. Amen? Amen. I'm a witness today uh, just by standing here, and as you're looking at me and you're reading this T-shirt, do you understand what this T-shirt means? It means go blue, right? It doesn't mean anything about go green, right? I was given to this uh, the other day as a Father's Day. I appreciate the gift. Uh, I like this shirt. I'll be wearing it to my mom's house, by the way. She's a Spartan fan. And so I'll be make sure I wear it to her house and so she can see that it says go blue. LOL, -L -L. does everybody know what LOL means? Laugh out loud. So Spartans, ha, 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 no, no, really, go blue. And that's what the shirt is all about. I'm a witness to the fact that I believe that the Michigan football team is one of the best football teams in the nation. I'm a witness to that fact wearing this shirt. You see, you, you are a witness to many, many things in your life. And God has called us to be a witness. Do, do, is that, does anybody remember what a witness is? What does a witness do? A witness provides testimony. For example, think about yourself if you were caught up in some uh, armed robbery of some sort and, and you had watched it happen. The, the police would take your statement and then, and then they would call you to go on the stand. And if you went on the stand, what would you be doing on the stand? You'd be testifying to two things, what you had seen and what you have heard. We are called to testify about our son, our, our God's son, Jesus Christ, about what we have seen and what we have heard in our lives. We're called to be a witness. We're called to be a testimony for Jesus Christ. Now, I began talking uh, at the beginning of this series about being obedient to God. Amen. That, and that's a tough thing to do sometimes because there's so many things that we have to be obedient to him in. I mean, let's just think for a moment. There's, off the top of my head, I can just think of a few things. We need to be obedient to him in prayer. The Bible says pray without never stopping to pray. And so if we stop to pray, if we stop and we don't pray in certain, certain situations, then we are not being obedient to the word of God by praying you know, with all things. Amen. What about giving tithes or offerings? The Bible says you should give tithes and offerings. Jesus said you, you should be generous with your finances because I've been generous with you. And so when we are not generous with our finances and we stop giving tithes and offerings, we are being what? Disobedient to the word of God. Cheerfully. Giving cheerfully. 
If you give and you're like, I can't believe he's asking for more money, I take that. Well, you're not being obedient to the word of God. That's my extra battery in case I ran out. I got to keep that. You're not being obedient, but because the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. We're called to be obedient in so many ways. And one of the ways we're called to be obedient and one of the most things that we fail at is being a witness. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples. It wasn't a wish. It wasn't asking us to do something. It was a command that we would become witnesses to testify of the great things that he has done. So the first week we talked about why Christians don't share their faith. Remember that? And I said that 95% of Of all Christians, 95% will never share their faith at all. And 90% of those 95 will never even give it a try. They'll never even try to open up their mouth and talk about their faith in front of other people. Now, let's just just look at reality for a moment. If there were 100 people in this room right now, and I stated that statistic... About 95% of all people never share their faith. That means only five people would be sharing or attempting to share their faith. Wow, what a staggering statistic. You think about the millions of Christians in the world. And so many people's lives are changed only by 5% of the people of Christians. So why is that? Well, the first week we talked about apathy, amen? Apathy is is a tough thing. And we said that there are three things that, 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 that keep us unmotivated to share the Lord with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is we misunderstand Jesus' commands or we just completely ignore them. One of the two, we know that Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples, but we like, oh, uh, you know, that's the pastor's job. But it's not. Also, we said that, that, that some, sometimes people have misplaced priorities in their lives. In other words, they put things over Jesus. They put doing things over Jesus. They put going out to fishing over Jesus. They put out going out and shooting and hunting over Jesus. They they, they go out and do all these things in their lives rather than doing something for Jesus. I I gave somebody a ride yesterday, and, and my conversation was, you need to get right. You need to get your life right. Stop spending around in circles because that's all your life is doing, and your first step is Jesus. And the guy said, no, it's not. I said, oh, it is. You see, your priorities are not, but God wants to be number one. And then the third thing, the third thing was that there will be no cell phones in heaven. (laughs) Well, that wasn't the third thing, was it? I just heard somebody's cell phone go off, so I thought I'd throw that out there. The third thing is that we often just don't care about what's going to happen to other people. We don't care about their fate. 57,000 cars on or about that drive by our church on average every day. And are they are they changed by coming by this church? Many of them don't even know that we're here. Many of them, when you say, have you ever have you ever had to use the the where are you located at? And you say, well, we're next to Arby's. Oh, yeah, you're that church. They never really know who we are. Uh, sometimes we say, sometimes Gail and I will say, well, we're, we're, we're next to Arby's, but, but if you go past Krispy Kreme, oh, I know right where you're at. <laughs> the two icons of Southfield Road, right? But sometimes we just don't care that they're going to hell. And we explained what hell was that week, the first week. But the Word of God tells us that we're all to be witness in our faith, Amen. Week two, we discussed the formula of how to tell others of our faith. It's really the know-how of how to build your testimony. And the Apostle Paul gave us that in, in Acts chapter 26. Remember that first he said, he said what? What he was like before he met Jesus Christ. And then he told King Agrippa, he told him how he met Jesus Christ. The when, where, what, how, who. And then he told King Agrippa who he has been since Jesus Christ. And that's really our testimony, amen? 
We have a great testimony in this church. I don't know if you know that. Many of you uh, who haven't been here uh, the whole three years or before that three years when we started, um, uh, many of you may, may, not, may not know the, 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 where the church was at. Financially, broken, Poor Pam. <laughs> that day that I met her, she had frizzy hair, five or six bills in her hands, and she's looking at me, all mean, and, what bill do I pay? <laughs> Financially, the church was broke. Missionally, missionally, the church was absolutely broke. The number of people that were coming to church was absolutely broken. And when we came in, it was just, God had just, just it's like God parted the waters for us. And now we have on the average, we have on the average, I'm just going to give you a few statistics of, of, of when we got here. We, we now have an average attendance of 51% higher than when we first got here. 51% higher. We've doubled we baptized last year 16 people. This church in its history, because trust me, we looked. This church in its history never in one year has ever had 16 baptisms. Never in one year. From the very beginning of the church to all the way to where we are today, 2016 we had 16 baptisms, and that's the most ever for one year in this church. Not only to mention that, in 2016, we had 16 baptisms, and, and, and that the three, for, for the three years, let me, let me rephrase that. For three years, we had, we had all those baptisms in three years, and I think we had how many? you remember? It was more than nine years combined of the previous nine years. So we added up the last nine years, and it came down to, I mean, that's amazing. God has really been working. You see, we have, we have a testimony. We can be a witness in this church to what God has been doing. I heard one time we were praying for windows. Pastor, we've been praying for windows for so long. Remember that, Dave? Dave told me that. We've been praying for windows for such a long time, and that first year, guess what we did? We paid cash for new windows. Praise God. So much has happened. We have a testimony to give people to tell them about our church. You would not believe what's been going on at Southfield Road Baptist Church. you got to come to the road because it's been amazing to see and to watch. Amazing. You have a testimony. We're reminded that that before we met Jesus, remember that we were lost, we were blind, we were wicked, we were dead, we were even enemies of God. And then last week, Pastor Eleazar, he had you write out a little bit about yourself. The before, the when you met Jesus, and after you met Jesus. A testimony, if you will. And, and, and I pray that you have shared that testimony with others. But now comes this week. This week is important. My goal for you this week is simply for you to overcome your fear in sharing your faith and for you to commit to share your story two times this week with other people. I don't care who, your brother, your sister, your uncle, your mom, your, your dog, even your frog. Give it a shot and see what happens. I'm going to ask that you open your Bibles with me to the book of Mark chapter 8. The book of Mark chapter 8. The book of Mark is in the second book of the New Testament, Matthew, then Mark, Mark chapter 8. And when you get there, let me know by saying, I am there. I am there as well. Thank you. I'll be there. That's what I, <laughs> I like that one too. I'm getting, I'm getting there. Hold on, pastor. I'm almost there. Mark chapter 8, the second book of the New Testament. Or oh, eighth chapter, I'm sorry. Chapter 8. 
This week we're discussing fear. Fear and witnessing. Particularly, we want to discuss defeating the fear. Have you anybody, has anybody ever been fearful of something before? Great. Why are we afraid so much? I don't get it. We're going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment before, but first we're going to read our scripture. Look with me at beginning at verse 27. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Now follow along with me. Jesus and Jesus went out with his disciples to the village of Caesar, Caesarea Philippi on the what? On the road. He asked his disciples, who do people say I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Now, notice that those are all people that are dead. But you, he asked them, who do you say I am? And Peter with his, you know, Peter has to jump in all the time. You're the Messiah. And he strictly warned them to tell no one about him. And then he began to teach them that the Son of God must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed, and rise after three days. He was openly talking about this, so Peter, here's Peter again, right? Here Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him. You're not going to die, Jesus. We're not going to let that happen to you. But look what happened. But turning around and looking at his disciples, Jesus... He rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Now, why is Jesus calling him Satan? Well, Jesus is calling him Satan because, look at your scripture, because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but of man's. You want to know the worst thing to do? is to think of your own concern rather than God's concerns. The worst thing to do is to, is to think about your own way, what you're dealing with, what's, what's going on with you, rather than what God has put before you. Look at verse 34. Summoning the crowd, along with his disciples. Where were they? Anybody know where they were? They were on the road. I love that story. They're on the road. There's so many de depictions of the road and the, and, 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 and the stories of, uh, of the scripture is just amazing. So summoning the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone wants to be my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit a man to gain the whole world, yet lose his life? What can a man give in exchange of his life? For whoever is ashamed of me, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous, sinful generation. Are we living in an adulterous, sinful generation today? Yes. Are we living in one? Absolutely. But Jesus says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes into the glory of his Father, of his holy angels. Wow, what a scripture. 90% of all Christians will not even attempt to share their faith in Jesus Christ. Why are we afraid? What makes us so afraid? Here, here are some, I want to I wanna quickly talk to you about what fear is. Fear in the Greek is a phobia. Does anybody have a phobia? Do you have a phobia? There's some phobias around. I just want to go through a couple of phobias. Here's, here's the example of what it is. It is a persistent or abnormal, you skip too far, there you go, or illogical fear of a specific thing or situation. That, that's what the definition of a phobia is. And, and here's, here's a phobia I want you to be with. Look at this a phobia. Ophibodo, I think that's how I said, Ophibophobia. 
You know what that is? Anybody know what that is? It's the fear of snacks. Snacks. You know, eating a snack? It's a fear of that. Are you, I'm not, listen, I don't have a fear of eating snacks. I like my chips and dip. I really do. I like eating the, the cherry tomatoes just right out of the container and eating them and straw. I like my snacks. I'm a snack kind of a guy. But I don't have a phobia for that, but some people do. What about this next one? Cacophophobia. I think that's how you say it. No. Close. It's the fear of ugliness. You're, you're afraid of being ugly. And it's a phobia to you. What, what, what about this next one? Here, here's one. Aviaphobia. Somebody must know what this one is. Aviaphobia. Fear of flying. My wife and I just flew back in from uh, Arizona. We had a nonstop flight. And, uh, and, and you know, has, has anybody not flown? Well, here's the thing. If you haven't flown, it's a very interesting thing. Um, I, I'd never flown in a, in a plane until I was, uh, I flew off to basic training in Fort Bliss, Texas, and I'll never, I'll never forget the takeoff. I was shocked by the takeoff because you're sitting there and they're going, and then all of a sudden you're like this. <laughs> and it feels like you're going and you're going and you're going and you're going. Well, we took off and we went up and then we leveled out and we're flying for about three and a half hours or so, three hours, 45 minutes. And then all of a sudden the plane does this. And it starts to descend. And it gets down to its descend. And, and, and if you didn't have a fear of flying, some of them, people might have had a fear of, fear of flying after we landed. But we landed at 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 in the morning, and we hit that tarmac. Bam! And it bounced. Boom! And then all of a sudden, the engines went on reverse and threw you into your seat. And if you don't have a Fear of flying, just try to ride with the pilot we were on. It might get you. Fear of flying. What's that? That was his first flight. What about this next one? Palacrophobia. Palacrophobia. Does, Al, do you know what that is? It's the fear of baldness. <laughs> Virginia's over there stroking Donnie's hair. <laughs> I'm, losing, I'm losing ground, right? Amen. I'm losing a little bit of ground on my head. Uh, but it's a fear of baldness. And I love this next one. This next one. Go to the next one. This is pentherophobia. Does anybody know what that is? Get ready for this. It's for men and women. They both have this fear. And it's the fear of mother-in-laws. <laughs> It's a fear of, of mother-in-laws. So, so people have a fear of their mother-in-laws. I'm sure I can get a witness on that. What about this next one? Glassophobia. Does anybody know what that is? I had this when I was a young child. The, the teacher would I, we'd be reading out loud. And, and even when I was in high school and junior high, I had this phobia that when they would pick on me and I'd have to stand up and I would have to read. Speaking in public. I had a fear of speaking. You may not know it now, but I had a fear of speaking in public. Many people have it. What about this next one? Look at that big word. I'm not even going to attempt to. Do you know what that fear is? It's the fear of big words. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes when I'm reading the scripture, or I'm, I'm, I'm reading my sermon, I have a fear of those big words because, you know, you stumble over those big words. And then the last one, the last one is this. Anybody know what this one is? is you, got, you got one more? Anybody know what that one is? That's witnessophobia. That's the fear of witnessing to other people, telling them about your faith. Witnessphobia. We have a lot of that. How do we overcome all these fears? How, how can we, as a, as a congregation of God-loving people, come over these fears, overcome these fears, especially the fear of witnessing? Well, number one in your book, you'll find that first we must understand that fear is normal. Write that down. Understand that fear is 
normal. We've all been scared at one point or another. I remember my first roller coaster ride at Cedar Point. I was petrified by the time we got up and we were headed on down. I was petrified. Some people have a fear of those. But, but, but look, listen to this, this fear that has happened in everybody's lives. In Abraham, for example, Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and 20, Abraham had a fear, and so he lied that his wife was his sister. The king, when he found out, went ballistic because the king felt like you were, he was putting him in jeopardy, that, that he could have slept with his wife and then all of a sudden had, had, had been cursed by God. But Abraham had a fear, and so he lied and called his wife his sister. Moses, for example, he was afraid. When Moses saw, everybody knows the story of Moses. I don't think there's any unbeliever that doesn't know the story of Moses. But when Moses saw the Egyptian beating up the the Jew, and and Moses went up and, and killed that guy and buried him in the sand, and when the next day came and one of the Jews had said something to him, Moses feared for his life, and that's why he fled. He fled Egypt. He had a fear of his life. And then Elijah, who can who can not think about Elijah when we're talking about fears? Elijah in in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 3. Now, does they, everybody should know who the who the god Baal is, who they, they, they were they were they were worshiping. And Elijah went up and challenged him. He challenged the, the priests of Baal and, and, and how that, that his God was way better than any that ba- God that they could conjure up. And so after defeating, defeating that God, after defeating that, it shows right in the next few verses that Elijah became scared of a woman. Now, she was obviously the most wicked woman in the Bible, but he was petrified of Jezebel. And then who could forget Peter? In, in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus has been arrested. Um, they have uh, beat him. And then all of a sudden, here comes Peter. And his fear drove him to deny Jesus three times. Fear. And then, of course, who can forget the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says this, When I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom, for I did not think it was a good idea to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Listen to this. The Apostle Paul, the one who wrote one-third of the New Testament, he said these words, I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. You see, folks, fear is a part of life. We have conflicts on the outside. We have conflicts on the inside. And, and fear is something that is normal to us. So how do we overcome fear? Well, first we have to understand that it is normal to be afraid. And then number two, number two, we must ask our friends to pray for us. Ask our friends to pray for Ephesians, Paul was great at asking people to pray for him and throughout the books of the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19, look at your page. Uh, look at there. Pray also for me that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. You know, there are two extremes to prayer. There are two extremes to prayer. Well, praying for the lost, should I say. The first extreme is that some Christians never pray for the lost. The second extreme is this, is that some, some Christians pray for the lost, but never do anything about it. They just leave it up to God. They never share the gospel. There are 55,000 homes in a two-mile radius of our church. And I wonder how many are lost. 
I want to challenge you today to start praying for those 55,000 homes that are in two-mile radius of our church. I want to challenge you today to start praying for the lostness in our community. Start praying, and then we're going to start doing something about it. I can't tell you the number of times that people have come to me and they have said these words, Pastor, will you go talk to my friend? Pastor, will you go talk to my neighbor? Pastor, will you go talk to my mom or my, my, my dad? They're lost. And, and I need you to go talk to them and, and tell them about Jesus. Do you know what my immediately thought, thought is in that when you guys bring me? Why don't you go do it yourself? Not being rude or anything, but, but listen, you have, you have a connection with them. You have a relationship with them. I don't have a relationship with them. And if anybody's going to get through to them, it would be somebody that has a relationship with them. So I think to myself that, 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 that thought, why don't you go talk to them? But, but I understand why is because fear keeps us from witnessing. Fear stops us. From witnessing. So we must ask our friends, just as the Apostle Paul did, we must ask our friends to to pray for us to overcome the fear of witnessing. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says this: Brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it is with you. So number one, we have to understand that fear is normal. Number two, we need to think about this, getting a group together to pray for you for witnessing. And then the third thing, the third thing I want to tell you today is to expect, expect to face, face is the key word, expect to face opposition. Jesus said these words, do you remember what I told you? A servant is not greater than His master, I am not greater than Christ Jesus. I could never be greater than Christ Jesus. I'm his servant. I do what he tells me to do. He is greater than I. And Jesus goes on to say, since they persecuted me, naturally, they will persecute you. You're going to receive some some, some opposition when you start telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Missionaries all over the world face opposition when they're telling people about Jesus Christ, when they're telling them about their faith. The Southern Baptist Convention, we, had, we, were, we were sending our missionaries. One of the things that we do when we go to the Southern Baptist Convention is we have a sending ceremony. And all the, all the, the missionaries gather together on the stage. And and so they brought one up, each one up at the same time, husband and wife team. And they would bring them up, sometimes kids, and there would, it was, it's complete darkness. And there's a light shining on them. And they say, hi, my name is so-and-so. We are going to be missionaries in this play, part of the world, the peoples of the European Republic, uh, uh, anywhere in North America, and, and the light is shining on them, and you see them. You, you specifically can see them. And then the program changes, and there are no lights. And all you hear is a voice saying, I'm going to be sent here. The reason why you don't see them is because they're being sent to part of the most dangerous areas in the world to be a Christian, to be a missionary. If their face is shown on the Internet, it can mean potentially death for them, even before they get there. We must understand that, 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 that we live in America and, and I love living in America because we have freedoms like no other. We have the freedom of religion, and I love the freedom of religion. I can go up openly and talk to anyone about Jesus Christ. But in the same respect, anybody can walk up openly and talk to me about them being gay and lesbian. But it's a freedom that we have. We're not persecuted as other churches and other people are persecuted. 
Did you know that there are 277, 277 people that lose their life every single month because of their faith around the world? There will be opposition. Even though we live in a free world, and in a free society to be able to talk about anything, to say things about anything, there will be opposition. When you go to speak your testimony to people, there will be opposition. I want to encourage you that, that, that you know that. But I want to tell you something. Paul says this in 2 Timothy 3, 12. All those who want to live godly lives in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. But I want to, I want to tell you something. Every time the church is persecuted, there is tremendous growth in the kingdom of God. Every single time. If you look in the Bible and you go through the book of Acts and you see where the church had been persecuted, you would see exponential growth. In the Bible, yes, there's going to face, we have to face opposition when telling people about Jesus. Now, I know that many of you are like me. Not all my family understands why we talk about Jesus. Many of our, my family don't understand why I'm, not, I'm a preacher and not a drunk. Many of my people understand why a lot of, don't, they don't understand me. My wife is the only Christian in her family, basically. Maybe not. There's two. Maybe there's three. But in my siblings, I'm the only Christian. You'll face opposition when you tell others about Jesus. I'll never forget the time we took the cross down to Mardi Gras. And, and I want to tell you about this specific story because it will ring truth in our lives about having opposition. Now, many of you would think standing up with a cross, holding the cross up, standing up there. Many of you would think nothing about it. You would think, wow, that is fantastic, isn't it? To stand up before 450,000 people and you're standing there with the cross and you're making a statement about how proud you are about your faith, sharing your testimony, but other people didn't feel like that. Many people didn't feel like that. In fact, I remember standing at one particular intersection and, and I was kind of the guy that was out and about kind of looking at the crowd and watching the crowd. And I happened to look over and saw three people huddled together. I remember this. And those three people huddled together where I could see them laughing and giggling, and, and I couldn't see their hands. So I wondered what they were doing. So I walked up, and I looked over one of the first. They did not see me. I walked up and looked over the shoulder, and I saw them urinating into a cup. And I heard them discussing about how they were going to throw it at us in the cross. Now, of course, me, I wasn't going to let that happen. I'll tell you the funny part of the story. The funny part of the story is I took a couple steps back, and I began kind of walking real fast at him, and I took my forearm to the guy who was urinating in the cup, and I hit him in the back. And everything that he had done win over all three of them. <laughs> the cup dropped, and they turned around, they looked at me, and I smiled at them, and they scurried off. But you will face opposition like never before sometimes. You will face opposition when you tell people about your faith in Jesus Christ. God, Jesus, the Bible, the Holy Spirit tells us that we are to be witnesses of everything we have seen and everything that we have heard. And that's exactly what we need to do. But I want to tell you that the, that the church grows at a time of persecution. Number four, number four, look at your next page. I believe it's on. Then I want you to focus, although we know that we are going to have problems telling people about Jesus, there's going to be some people that, that are going to give us opposition. When they give you opposition, I want you to look at number four, and I want you to focus on your rewards. That's how you get rid of that fear of opposition, that fear of persecution, is that you focus on what your reward is going to be. Now, there are two elements in your book of reward. The first one is heaven. 
It's eternal. The Bible says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because you're great. Your reward, it will be great in heaven. And I rejoice at the fact when people come against me. Because I know my reward will be great in heaven. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. And each one will be rewarded according to his own labor. We will be rewarded in heaven for our obedience to God despite our fears. And then there's the earthly, the earthly reward. Philemon chapter 6. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will receive a full understanding of everything good we have in Jesus Christ. Our earthly reward when we witness to other people is that we understand what we have in Christ Jesus. Remember how we witness, right? We tell them of what we were before we knew Jesus. We tell them how we come to know Jesus, and then we tell them what Jesus has done in our lives since Jesus. We, it helps us remember the blessings that we have, where we come from, and what we've done, and more importantly, what Jesus has done. I want to tell you something that God blesses everyone who brags on his son. God blesses everyone who brags on his son. So when you're afraid, focus on the rewards, the, the eternal reward, the, the reward in heaven and the reward that you have on earth. And then fifth, fifth, forsake the win them mentality. Now, now, now we, have a, we have this thing about winning, don't we? We want to win. In fact, in fact, in the older days, they didn't call it evangelism. They called it, anybody know what they called it? Soul winning. Not soul losing, but soul winning. And, and we want to win at everything we do, right? How many of you are fans of the Detroit Lions? Raise your hand. Well, that's it? How many, how many of you are fans of, of any type of sport? Oh, okay, we got some tigers, uh, hockey, right? Right, I watch a lot of MMA. I like to see that. I like watching that. I, I get a thrill out of that. I like watching it. But, but every one of their class designations, uh, they got super flyweight. They got flyweight. They got uh, middle. They got, they got, they got featherweight. They have, I, mean, I mean, they got people like this tall and about that skinny and, and fighting each other. But then they have the big guys, the heavyweights. The middle heavyweights. So they have all these classifications. And when one of them wins the belt, do you know what they're called? Let's say the heavyweight, a heavyweight wins the belt. What, what, what do you think that they call them? Champion. No. They call them the heavyweight champion of the world. We want to win, don't we? Yes. We have to get rid of the win them mentality. Because here's the truth. Our job is to tell them about Jesus. Our job isn't to win them. God's job is to win them. Go to the next slide. Look at that scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5-7. through 7. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through who you believed as the Lord assigned to each... I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives, it's only God who gives the growth. Listen to me, our job is to go out and tell people of our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not our job to win them to the Lord. We're just to be faithful, and we're to go, and we're to tell people. 
You know, uh, I have a, uh, I've been doing a little landscaping over there at our house, and, and, and there's a little spot um, that is in the shade, and it's just bare ground, right? It's just bare ground. And so I said, well, you know, I got to get some seed. So I read the directions of the seed package, right, to, to plant some grass. So shady grass is what it needed because it's all in the shade. I cut the trees back, and I did all this stuff and get it ready. And so, and so the first thing that the bag says is what? To get the soil ready. So you got to rake it up. you got to kind of mess it up a little bit. you got to rake it up, get it ready, get the soil ready. And then the next thing it says is that, is that you're to lay the seed. So here I am outside. I got a bag of seed about this bag much, and I'm, and I'm out there grabbing handfuls, and I'm throwing the seed, throwing the seed. I'm out here throwing the seed. I take a little bit and just sprinkle it right here, and I, and I put the seed all over the place. Well, today if you go over there, you'll see that there's clumps of seeds here and clumps of I don't know how those clumps of seeds got there, but they got there, and, and, and some little seed will be over there, and, and I'll think, wow, I really missed that spot there. So I'm out watering it. Friday I did this, and, and so Friday I, I watered it twice. Saturday, I mean, even though the rain has been coming, I've been out there faithfully whoosh, watering, 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 watering. I get the, the ground ready to go. I put all the seed out, and I water it. But the only guarantee that it grows comes from God. No matter what I do to it, and how many times I water that seed, it's only by God's gift that it grows. And that's what happens when we witness. You see, you prepare the ground, you get it ready, you plant the seed, you water it, but God does the growing. You have to lose the I'm going to win it all mentality. You got you to stop saying, I won that person over to the Lord because you didn't win anything. You just planted and watered. God did all the rest. We have to get rid of the win it all mentality. Next, number six, don't forget that you have good news. I don't like grumpy Christians. I'm just going to let you know that. Now, I've said this before. I, I don't like a grumpy Christian. You ever saw a grumpy Christian? He's the one that, that, that always is walking around, kicking the can, saying, poor pitiful me. Poor, listen to me, you have good news. You have the greatest news for anyone to receive. Look at what your scripture says. Look there. The gospel means good news. This is the description of what happened when Jesus was born. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. And there were shepherds living out in the flocks nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they said, don't be terrified. Don't be scared. But the angel of the Lord said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that is for who? All people. Today in the town of Bethlehem, the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. You have good news. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says these words. Peter says this. The brother of Jesus says this. Honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks for the reason of hope that is in you. That word, that word hope uh, is transcribed over to mean 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's transcribed to mean the hope of eternal life that you have. By faith, through the good news of Christ Jesus, we have a Savior. And God has entrusted us, his people, to spread that out, to spread the seeds, to, to water it, and then to watch it grow. Pastor Tim Jones has not grown this church. I haven't grown this church. It's great to know that we've had a 51% increase in attendance. I've watered, I've tilled, I've watered, I planted, I watered. But God has grown this church. Not Tim Jones. I only do what is required of me. And God has grown. We have good news. We must teach people about the good news. There's so much bad news in the world today. Have you turned on the news? Oh, bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. Then when it gets to the weather, more bad news. <laughs> Very seldom do they tell you about good news. All they hear is bad. We, the church, have the good news. We, the church, must go out and tell the world about the good news of Jesus Christ. Remember, you have the good news inside of you. Everyone will die one day. And it's our jobs to share the gospel. In Luke chapter 8, verse 1, it says this, After this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And then number seven, finally, finally. Number seven, finally remember. It is an obedience issue. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus again said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I send you. You. It's an obedience thing. The one thing I do know about my father is that he was in the army. The only reason I know that of my father is because I remember looking at my mother's dresser and she had a, she had a statue, a little statue of a soldier. And it said my dad's name on it. That's the only idea that I thought that my dad was ever in the military. You know, during D-Day, that was probably the bloodiest day ever in a war. D-Day, they went to go take the, the beach. And the Germans were ready, waiting patiently. And the stories, some of the stories, I, I love watching war movies, and I have, I have Pearl Harbor, I have, I have a Saving Prior Ryan, I have, I have all these war movies, and, and the biggest one is D-Day I have. That's the one. Charging towards Normandy. The boats are coming. They drop down. And oftentimes when they drop that dropped that thing down where those soldiers were about ready to run out, oftentimes they were mowed down and they didn't even get out of the boat. Their friends, there's a story about one guy who said, who said that, 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 that the first few guys were shot and killed and that they had to literally step on their friends and step over their friends so they could get out of the boat and get to the beach. Have you ever wondered why we don't speak German in America? Because the Germans didn't win the war. If the Germans won the war, we'd be speaking German today. But it was because of those faithful men that stormed that beach at Normandy, that stepped upon their own friends, 
And you figure, you have to ask yourself, well, well how, why in the world would they have done that? How in the world did they have the courage to do that? And it's all about obedience. You see, they were taught in the military, they were taught in the army to take the beach. Under no circumstances, you must go forward, you must move forward. And then they were taught that they need to hear the orders of their superiors and do what the orders tell them to do, to do what their superiors have told them to do. That's how we ended up inching along. A lot of people dead, a lot of Americans dead, but that's how we breached Normandy, was through obedience. And God is calling us to obedience. He's calling us to, to be obedient by witnessing to all the other people in the world. He's calling us to that. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sends me, I send you. At the end of the day, witnessing, testifying, is an, is an obedience issue. Because it's an obedience issue, I cannot wait to witness until I feel like it. Because it's an obedience issue, I cannot wait to witness until I want to do it. Because it's an obedience issue, I can't wait until I feel like I'm led to do it. I need to be in obedience to God. So what now? Based on what you've heard and what you've seen in God's word today, what should you do? Well, in James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Do not merely listen to the word of God, so to deceive yourselves, but do what it says. We must make a decision to defeat our fears. We must make a decision each day to defeat our fears. Look at this next slide. This is a picture of a burned boy. He's from Africa. His mother and his whole village was infiltrated by, by Muslims. And they killed his mother and his father. And as a young boy, they, they often would take the young boys and make them into Muslims so they become fighting as well, so they could go out and fight later. And so they would take them. This year, little boy said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to renounce my Savior. And so they had already burned down the village, and there were fires going, so they took the young boy and threw him alive into the fire. The Bible says this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power and love and self-discipline. So you must never be ashamed to tell others of your Lord. You know, I was, my wife and I like watching um, America's Got Talent. Do you like watching that show, America's Got Talent? We love watching that. It's funny when they mess up. Some people just go on there to mess up. It's, it's, it's a great show. It's a hilarious show. Well, there was this one girl who shared her story. She had to make a decision to defeat her fears. There she walks on stage and she stands before the judges on that big X. And her whole body is burned. You can see the skin grafts on her face. Her eyes don't work correctly. She was on an airplane. She was in a children's choir from Africa. And she was on this airplane. And they were about ready to land. They were coming in for a landing, and she said that they heard a loud noise. And she was sitting next to her best friend. And she grabbed a hold of her hand of her best friend. And all of a sudden, the plane burst in flames. Out of 179 people, two people Two people survived, and one of them was her. 
So in all that fear, of what do people make, think I look like? What are people going to say about me when our fingers are, are, are not quite right? When her body just doesn't move quite right because of all the burns and the scars and the skin grafts and all that stuff on her. She stands before millions of people. She had to get over her fear. And she sings. And she sung beautifully. And as she sung, that song, as she, she was singing that song, you could see, it just in her body language, that all the scars, all the burns, all the disfiguration was nothing because she was beautiful. You see, folks, we have to overcome our fear. And we have to do what Jesus Christ has called us to do. And he has said to us, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Will there, be, will there be fear? Yes. Will there be trials and tribulations? Yes. Will there be people that are standing in our way and trying to be obstacles? Yes, there will be, but we must take the stand. With all the fears, with all the problems, with all the issues and tell people about Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this afternoon, and, and we thank you for your word. And, and Father, as we thank you for your word, we, we ask you, Lord, to, 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 to change us in our life. We have heard your word. Now change us, Father God. Move us. Have the Holy Spirit move us to change, to, to, to be a place that, that, that tells other people about Jesus, to tell other people about the Word. Oh, Lord, move us. Move us. Move us to invite people to church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lastly, on your sheet, you'll find that it says, knowing it is God's will and with God's help, start right now. I will not let fear, the keep, the, let fear keep me from witnessing. There's a little place to sign. I want you to sign your name right there. If you're, if you're going to stand firm, if you're not going to let fear keep you from witnessing, and put today's date on it. And then remember this week's prayer that's in your bulletin. God, I want my friends to know about Jesus the way I do. Help me defeat the fear when I think about talking to them about Jesus. And then listen to me. I want you to go out and share two times this week your story to someone else. And I want to ask that, that as you do that, please let me know that you've done that so, that so that I want you to come up and I want you next week to tell us about that experience, if you would do that. So tell two people about your testimony this week. Would you stand with us? We're going to be singing. Only trust in him, hymn number 317. I know we went a little long, but on a Father's Day, what a great Father's Day message from our God the Father. Amen. So I'm going to ask that you would stand with us and sing only trust him and if you have an issue today is a day for your salvation if you want that to see that happen in your life come forward you just seen this magnificent baptism this morning if you've never been baptized now's the time to come forward to receive baptism come in the name of jesus just come now come every soul by sin oppressed there's mercy with the Trusting in His Word Only trust Him, only trust Him Only trust Him now He will save you, He will save you He will save you now For Jesus shed His precious
One last thought. I have a fear of singing in front of people. It's a phobia that I have. I love sitting, standing up front because nobody else sees what I do, and so I just block everyone out from behind me, and I'm in my own little world about singing. I have a fear of getting up in front of singing in front of everybody. Gail was going, she, she was going to go and be part of this choir. Um, and it was a great thing. She got to go down front, and it was really a great thing. And as she began talking to me, she said, you know, you really should do it. And I said, oh, no, that's not me. I'll preach, but I'm not going to sing. I'm not going to be in the choir. And then God kind of was working on me. I have a fear of it. And by the time we got to the stadium, I said, I'm going to do it. I put that fear behind me. I pushed it away because I knew it would be something that God wanted me to do. I'm not going to stand up here and sing to you. You probably wouldn't want to hear it. But I was with hundreds of other people singing in a choir in front of thousands and thousands of people in a stadium. And I pushed my fear away. But God gave me the strength to do that. And if I can do that, you surely can push away the fear of going to tell people about Jesus. I want to encourage you to do that this week. Are we forgetting anything before we close? No. Okay, let's close in prayer. What's that? Oh, the, the store will be open for kids. If you have, uh, if you have money, uh, if you have the road bucks, is what we call them, the store will, will now be open. So the store is downstairs for the kids that they can buy stuff. So, uh, so I want to encourage that. So let's close in the word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you. And we ask you, Lord, to show us the vision that you have for this church. We know, Lord, that it's not just us. We know that your kingdom will reign throughout this world, but, but Lord, show us the vision you have. Lord, is it to be at 150 people? Is it to be at 200 people? What is your vision for us? Father, let it that be a burden in our hearts to go out and witness to people. Let us be a burden in our hearts to know that, 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 that many people are going to hell without you. And it is all about you. So, Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Give us the courage. Help us push away the fear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.